speaker tonight, Ellen Knight. <clears throat> Ellen is a Winchester historian, a former president of the Historical Society here, and serves as the reference archivist down at the town hall. That's where the archives that pulls all the picture and written history of Winchester. Um, she is an author of a number of books. Uh, she's authored the Society's Artists of Winchester, the Children's History of Winchester. She has written history uh, of the Winchester Hospital, the music school. Uh, she just completed the history of the Anchor Society here in Winchester, which, and is, and her latest book is, of course, 500 Sheets, which will be available tonight. So please welcome Ellen. Ellen? Thank you. The story I have to tell you tonight has got drama, war and peace, a desperate situation, a moral crisis, people coming to the rescue more than once, years apart on different continents, and we have nothing. <laughs> 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 ah, a handsome hero. <laughs> <laughs> Our story could begin with his ancestry, but suffice it to say that he was Irish on both sides. And we'll just begin in 1917 when he was born here in Winchester. <coughs> okay. Now, 1917, for those of us who come from the 20th century, was the beginning of the modern era with its automobiles and airplanes and cinema and women's liberation. But of course, the most significant event of 1917 was the U.S. entry into World War I. The United States declared war in April. Our hero was born in June and given the name John Douglas Hanlon. He was, of course, blissfully unaware of the war while it was being fought. But as he grew up, he would have known about it, if only because there was a roll of honor outside the town hall and a war memorial outside the high school. But he probably also knew men who were veterans. His dad, John E. Hanlon, was not a veteran, but he was a policeman, which surely had an impact on his upbringing. Hanlon once said, my father was a cop in a town of 12,000, which was quite rich. Before World War II came along, in the 1930s, while still a youth, Hanlon became a hometown hero in the ways boys typically became young heroes. He not only played football, he was one of the star players. He was a halfback, according to the Winchester Star, the best defensive back on the circuit, a vicious tackler who can also hit the line and pull down a pass if necessary. His ability to diagnose plays and intercept passes has proven very valuable, and his wing back on defense, an inspiration. During his junior year, the team became Middlesex League champions. Next year, he was co-captain, and the team tied for first place in the league. He also played basketball and baseball, and was senior vice president. As a youth then, he learned about teamwork and leadership, both of which he'd need a few years later. In high school, he also picked up a nickname, Steamer. A dozen years or more later, when his name was back in the newspapers, he was still called Steamer. After high school, he spent some time working. Now remember, he was not one of the rich kids. And when he graduated, it was still the Depression. So he did not go to college immediately. But then, according to a story I heard from his daughter, he was out mowing the lawn one day when his coach came by and said something like, Hanlon, what are you doing? You should be in college. 
So he got his act together and went to the University of New Hampshire. In college, he was very involved in campus life. Listen to this. Four years in the student council, chair of the junior prom committee, four years playing football, participation in hockey and lacrosse, member of the Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity, and active in the interfraternity organization, Cask and Casket. He was one of the UNH students chosen for representation in the National Collegiate Who's Who. And on top of that, he did study. He was an English major. His ambition from about the time, the age of 12, 10 was to be a newspaper man. One other thing he did in college was to join the Reserve Officers Training Corps, or Rotsing. Again, he excelled, was a battalion commander, a member of the Rossi Honor Society, Scabbard and Blade. However, he did not envision a lifelong military career. Speaking of how he got into the Army, he, said, he wrote, or he said, I was granted a Thomason Act commission. That meant you went on duty for a year, and after that period, the Army had the option of offering you a regular commission. Well, he was in the Army a lot longer than one year. On the day he received his degree, he entered the U.S. Infantry with the rank of second lieutenant. He was assigned to the 26th Infantry Regiment, part of the 1st Division at Fort Devens. In October 1941, he was promoted to 1st Lieutenant. Less than two months later, America was at war. He wrote, Pearl Harbor came, and that settled where I'd spend the next few years. I didn't have the guts to try for the Air Corps, but when I saw the notice for paratrooper volunteers, I applied immediately. I still owed money for the scholarship at the university, and there was $100 a month more for paratroop officers. I also was caught up in the glamour that went with jumping. The few troopers I saw in their boots struck me as 10 feet tall. In April 1942, Hanlon transferred to the Parachute Corps. He spent 18 months training at Fort Benning, Georgia, during which time he was promoted to captain. Then on September 1st, 1943, he went overseas. He was in England with the 502nd Parachute Infantry, Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne, nicknamed the Screaming Eagles. This may be his company, but if not, this is how he would have looked, free combat. They got a little bit dirtier in action. Now, it is not my purpose tonight to tell you all about the 101st Airborne or the war in Europe. I want you to get our hero uh, to Belgium fairly quickly. So I'll just say simply, and you can read more in the book. <laughs> he was at D-Day, parachuting in before la the landings on the beach, and he was part of Operation Market Garden and parachuted into Nazi-occupied Poland. After this operation, he was awarded a bronze star as a, well as the medal he said he didn't even try for, a purple heart. <laughs> While taking a breather on the edge of a foxhole, along with an army doctor, he was shot by a German sniper. According to the Winchester Star, the thing missed being a very serious injury by a fraction of an inch. When he was hit, he was beside the regimental surgeon, who according to Major Hanlon, was treating him almost before the latter hit the ground. <laughs> Only a hundred feet away was a jeep waiting to remove wounded to the hospital, and in five minutes, Major Hanlon was in it. So, he was back in England to recover. It so happened that another Winchester boy, Lieutenant John H. Murphy, was also recovering from wounds in England. He wrote that, quote, a wounded member of Major Hanlon's outfit in the next cot to him told him that all the boys swore by steamer who is rated one of the best officers in his outfit. Though Major Hanlon, to his men and superiors, he was still steamer in his hometown. Now, after he was, um, after he was fit for duty again, he joined his battalion in Mourmelon, France, France in December. Then the order came to move north. It was getting dark when Hanlon's group climbed aboard the cattle trucks used to transport the men. 
During the night, Hanlon wrote, the column stopped for what was a long delay of maybe 30 minutes. A young lieutenant on the old man's staff came along with a map and told me that the place we were headed to was changed. Where is it now? I asked him. Some place called Bastogne, he said. I'm not going to tell you the whole story of the Battle of the Belge or the part of it known as the Siege of Bastogne. Suffice it to say, because all seven main roads in the densely wooded Ardennes Highlands converged on on the town of Bastogne. Control of its crossroads was vital to the German attack. The Americans got there first, but the Nazis were converging, converging on the American positions. The siege of Bastogne lasted from December 20th to the 27th, after which the American forces were relieved by elements of George General Patton's Third Army. The Americans were given positions in and around the town. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this map, but perhaps you can see the gray splotch in the middle. That's Bastogne. And there's a blue ring around, which shows where the various American divisions and regiments were holding the line. The circles show where the 502nd P PIR, Hanlon and his men, were concentrated northwest of Bastogne. The 502nd was headquartered at the Roll Chateau, just south of Longchamp. Our hero saw action in the area of Champs and a little village called Hembrou, located on the road between Champs and Bastogne. Were the Germans intending to advance that way, passing through Hembrou? Yes, they were. This was Hitler's final and most desperate lunge, Hanlon wrote. A few days before Christmas, we of the 101st Airborne hastily took up defensive positions in a ring around Bastogne. We were ourselves surrounded by the onrushing German troops, rather like the hole in a donut. The paratroop battalion I commanded, some 600 strong, was ordered into Hemerul a little village in the Ardennes, about two miles northeast of Bastogne. We were short of food, low on ammunition, and outnumbered. There was another problem, and this is where the sheets come in. As Hanlon recounted in a story published by the Boston Globe on November 9, 1947. And let's hear the story as Hanlon himself wrote it. But just a few notes before I start that story. In his story, he focused on one battle, which he said lasted 20 minutes. But the fighting com continued after this first battle, and he saw much more action than covered in this story. At the end of this Globe story, we will jump ahead a few years, passing over the story of his Silver Star, his further promotions, and other action. But needs must. Finally, uh, the, the photos I'm using are not necessarily of the 101st Airborne. So the men you see were probably not the ones he commanded, but similar. Uh, and, and I may just warn you that I still tend to get a little bit weepy at some of the parts of this story. I know this story up and down, in and out, backwards and forwards, and there's still parts of it that get me choked up. Uh, anyway, now, to his story. The story begins in Bastogne. That is where General McAuliffe, during the Battle of the Bulge, snarled one good American word, nuts, to a German command that he surrender his surrounded division. My battalion helped make the general's retort stick. But this is not a recap of the battle. It is the story of 500 bed sheets. They saved American lives, these same sheets, and still trouble one man's conscience. The facts are few and simple. The job of our battalion was to defend a hill north of Bastogne, near the hamlet of Hemerol, a dirt road, a village square, a watering trough, 20-odd homes, a church. That's Hemerol. 
We took up position around Emerald four days before Christmas, 1944. We awoke after our first night there, assured of a white and not pleasant Christmas. A foot of snow covered the ground. The Germans, quiet for the moment, would have a field day if they came our way. Our dark uniforms against the white background made us perfect targets. We needed camouflage, lots of it and fast. Bed sheets was an obvious answer. I went to the mayor in Hemroll. Now, in a later version, he said he sent his executive officer, but the rest of the story is essentially the same. And told the mayor our, our dilemma. I promised that if he would collect the sheets from his people, we would make every effort to return them. Why I promised, I don't know now. <laughs> but we wanted those sheets badly. A brain oldster who had twice seen his village invaded during his lifetime, the mayor quickly agreed to help. He suggested that each villager place his name and the number of sheets donated on a slip of paper <coughs> included in the bundle. Thus, we would have a record for returning the sheets at some future date. How soon can you have them, I asked. The mayor replied quietly, I will have them for you within the hour. One hour seemed optimistic. I would have settled for two. But as I walked back to my command post, I heard the church bell begin to ring. Villagers streamed from their homes and headed for the church. The burgomeister waiting at the door quickly told the people, as each group arrived at the church, he said simply, bring here as many sheets as you have. The Americans need them. He explained, too, about the receipt. The villagers took him at his word. Every sheet in Hemerol was ours. Old ladies deposited large bundles of handmade linen on the church steps. Children struggled out with arms loaded. One man brought in a sled load of sheets collected from several homes. Footnote. Mayor Gaspard later told a Globe reporter, we had 48 sheets from Hemroll. People in other villages gave sheets too, and that's how the American officer got his 500. So, back to Hanlon's story. The mayor collected the receipts. On the bottom of one, written in scrawled English, was the message, God bless you Americans. We had our 500 sheets. On Christmas Day, the Germans attacked in the Hemerol area. The battle lasted only 20 minutes, but it was one of those close-ins, hysterical <coughs> affairs. The attack was turned back, and we counted the result. Six German tanks destroyed. Enemy dead, 57. Enemy captured, 35. Our casualties, three men slightly wounded. The sheets paid off for us and for Hemerol. You can't hit, as the saying goes, what you can't see. A few days later, we left Hemerol for other fields. The sheets went with us. A week or two later, the snow disappeared, and along with it, the sheets. I even lost the receipt. I've since thought many times about those sheets and my promise to return them. Recently came the jolt. A group of newspaper men returned to Europe last summer for a look-see at the battlegrounds three years after. One reporter visited what he described as a tiny village north of Bastogne. Yes, the villagers told him. Everything was well with them now, considering. But, offered one cautiously, we do wish that the Americans who promised to return our sheets would do so now. <laughs> Since reading these words, my conscience has been kicking up again. The tiny village was Hemroll, all right. 
and I'm the Americans who made the promise. In January, I am returning to Europe to see the Olympic Games, among other things. I wish I could take with me the 500 sheets, siege, the 500 sheets and dump them on the doorstep of Hemerald's Church. Maybe I will find a way. <coughs> this went the 1947 version of viral. <laughs> it was picked up by newspapers across the country. It got on the radio, and he himself was invited to speak on the radio. The Globe followed the whole story. <laughs> At its conclusion, Life magazine did a feature. Even Boy's Life did a story. Someone as far as away, as away as Sydney, Australia commented on it. Once the first Globe story appeared, Immediately, some people sent in sheets or checks to buy sheets. Some of the men, his men, read the story and contributed sheets. The Pepperell Manufacturing Company and Juan Sutter Mills donated sheets. The Sears Roebuck department store offered a 10% discount on all sheets shipped to Hanlon. He got about 100 sheets that way, but the goal was 500. And then Winchester pitched in. Winchester rallied its troops and organized a drive. In two weeks, he was ready to re repay the Belgians. Now, if anyone in Winchester in November 1947 did not get or read the Boston Globe and missed Hanlon's confession, it did not matter. For the Winchester Star printed, whoops, sorry, whoops, this headline on its front page, Steve <coughs> Hanlon needs sheets. <laughs> <laughs> Former high school football star wants to make promise good. <clears throat> A lieutenant colonel, silver star, bronze star, purple heart, commendations. Steamer Hamlin needs sheets. Would Winchester support a hometown boy who did its bit during the war and had a troubled conscience over an unfulfilled promise to people who helped save American lives? You bet it would. And it did. People in my hometown of Winchester, Massachusetts, began stopping me in the street, asking what they could do, Hamlin wrote. Many telephoned and offered donations. A committee was formed, and within a week, a collection date was set and a program planned. The clergy of Winchester's 10 churches were involved. 48 women's groups helped get the word out. Committee chairman Gladys Toy said that, the committee was the whole town. Although hardly of great significance in world affairs, Hanlon wrote in 1962, here was an opportunity to pay a debt of honor. Perhaps most important, there would be the inner reward of simply having kept my word. On the afternoon of Sunday, November 23, 1947, <laughs> In memory of the church bell rung at Hemroll, the bells of Winchester's churches and town hall rang out calling townsfolk to a special meeting where the price of admission was one sheet. <laughs> As recorded in the Winchester Star, it was a sight rarely seen in Winchester. People appeared in the streets, in automobiles, and on foot, all carrying sheets and all heading for the high school. Young and old, rich and poor, high and low, were in the little groups converging on the high school, now and then stopping to raise their eyes to the sky, where Navy planes from Squantum, commanded by a Winchester boy, Lieutenant Conrad Larson, roared overhead in formation as a salute to the festivities. This photograph from Life magazine shows Hanlon receiving sheets at the auditorium door. <laughs> Hanlon later confessed that, as I stood there watching my neighbors pile their sheets in the lobby of the high school auditorium, the lump in my throat grew big. 
Inside the auditorium, every seat was filled. So some people stood through the program. On the stage, the American and Belgian flags were displayed. There was music. There were speakers, including the Belgian consul for New England, Dr. Albert Nave, and of course, Hanlon. After telling his story, Hanlon asked another Winchester paratrooper with the 101st Airborne Division, Jerry Ficocello, onto the stage to give a demonstration of parachuting equipment, which fascinated the kids. And to the end of the meeting, the sheet count was 540. Mm -hmm. With the 100 sheets he already had, plus some that came in later, Hanlon had 679, or more. The figure varies in different reports to take to Hemroll. Afterward, the star reported, it was a heartwarming experience. The program gripped because of its spontaneity, because it belonged to everyone. One sensed the sincerity of purpose that welded speakers and audience into one close-knit group, present because the cause was one that appealed to their neighborliness, generosity, and sense of appreciation. There was no compulsion. Everyone came and gave because he wanted to help a local boy and war hero make good his promise to some friendly Belgians who had aided our troops in time of mortal stress. It was the sort of thing that appeals to Winchester, that has always appealed to me. <laughs> you felt a thrill of pride as you saw your friends and neighbors hurrying through the streets to the school with their tribute of sheets. Your pride intensified when you saw the splendid manner in which the meeting in the auditorium was conducted. And you continue to be proud and happy as you listen to Jack Hanlon and realized that you have young men like him in town. On December 30th, Hanlon sailed from New York on the ship America for Cherbourg, intending to spend six to eight months working as a reporter in Europe. Due to a delay, the sheets were not on board with him. Determined, uh, to deliver them himself, he waited to visit Hemroll until the six huge packing cases arrived at Antwerp and were shipped to Bastogne. Meanwhile, he went to the Olympic Games where he met up with Maribel Vincent Owen, <laughs> another Winchester native, a former Olympic medalist and professional Paris skater who was there working as a reporter. She noted that Jack, a very robust guy is already suffering a moderate attack of nerves over what he terms the approaching ceremonie des draps de vie. <laughs> well, this ceremony of the bed sheets that she mentioned was in Belgium called Winchester Day. Imagine Winchester Day celebrated not here, but 3,500 miles away in a foreign country. February 21st, 1948, was cold in Belgium. There was snow on the ground, as there had been when Hanlon was there before. When he arrived in Bastogne, he was greeted by the governor of Luxembourg and the mayors of Bastogne, Hemerl, and Longchamp, which at one time included Hemerl. Now Hemerl is part of Bastogne. They drove to a hill overlooking Hemerl and walked the few hundred yards to the village church. People lined the street, waving and cheering. Every house along the way was decorated with Belgian and American flags. Boy Scouts served as a guard of honor. The church was decorated with pine boughs. At the church, it had been planned that Mayor Victor Gaspar ring the bell. Instead, he told Hanlon, you ring the bell. He did not have to tell me twice, 
Hanlon reported to the Winchester Star. I grabbed the rope and rung the bell for a full five minutes. The villagers, who I must admit were standing just a few yards off, then crowded to the church entrance and I proceeded to distribute the sheets. Although Hanlon lost the receipts in 1947, Gaspar had kept his own record and saw to it that each person received the exact number he was doing. <laughs> I never had such a thrill in my life, Hanlon wrote. I will never forget the warmth, <coughs> enthusiasm, and appreciation that these people showed me this day. He walked around the entire village and talked with practically all the people. And of course, the villagers had to take the sheets home, followed by the photographers, to make sure that American sheets fit Belgian beds, <laughs> which they did. And they were very good sheets. In fact, the sheets Hanlon gave to Joseph Rufos are kept to this day by his granddaughter. This is she and the sheets are on the table. She told a story that when she was a little girl, she would always say, Mama, I want to sleep on the American sheets. <laughs> and as often as possible, her mother would put the American sheets on her bed. And now they're hers. Now back to Winchester Day, Hanlon wrote, Before I left, Mayor Gaspar said simply, You have made Hemerol a happy village. I replied, and I hope he understood. Hemrul has made me a pretty happy guy. Hanlon was driven to some other villages and made an honorary citizen of Longchamp. <coughs> These pictures aren't very good quality, but you can still see here that the officials have been giving him things to take home. And this picture also shows how tall he was compared to the Belgians. If you look at him in pictures with other Americans, he's not particularly tall. He was six feet tall. But you saw the picture of the little girls who were cheering away. Uh, a few of those girls are still alive, and what they remember is that he was so tall. <laughs> um, and here is the honorary citizen document, which calls him Colonel and noble citizen of the USA, stoic defender and savior of Hemrol, one of the glorious conquerors of the bloody combats of the Rhineland where he pursued the Germans, and goes on to say, considering the touching and symbolic gesture which he rendered on February 21st, 1948, in recognition and remembrance for Hemrol, saved by his daring and bravery, the conduct, valiant and without equal, of the GIs in the defense and liberation of our Ardennes, the inseparable union forged in blood and victory between the people of the USA and the people of Belgium during the fight against a common enemy during the wars of 1914 to 1918 and 1940 to 1945, the community of idea closely uniting forever our democratic peoples we award him the certificate of honorary citizen, citizenship of the commune of Longchamp. <clears throat> you do get a sense that this, this was an opportunity for Belgians to thank and honor all Americans. And the people of Winchester's who gave sheets, they were remembering all their boys and everyone who helped them. So the sheets were highly symbolic and the whole thing emotionally charged. At the village of Foy, location of an American military cemetery, Hanlon placed a wreath at the foot of a pole bearing the American flag. The last event of the day was lunch back at Bastogne, which lasted six and a half hours, <laughs> <laughs> since it included speeches. <clears throat> Hanlon was asked to deliver thanks to the citizens of Winchester, and the town was toasted. <laughs> In all, Hanlon reported to the Star, Winchester Day was wonderful. At every turn, 
I was thanked for repaying my debt and not forgetting. That he remembered and came back was so important to the Belgians. Madame Nicole Mastereau, who lived in the chateau on the outskirts of Hemel, told Hanlon that in a village like this, the ground is poor, the life is hard. You have given them a little page in history. They are proud of it, this little page, because it is theirs. It makes them better. Hanlon commented, and since the little page has my name written on it as well, so, in a humble way, am I. This page in history belongs to Winchester as well. In Hanlon's account of Winchester Day, he continued to say, Throughout the whole day, I never lost sight of the fact that one group of people made the whole affair possible. That would be, of course, the people of Winchester. Winchester Day was their day and I'm happy and appreciative about the whole thing. The Belgians were so grateful that the story does not end with the end of Winchester Day. During the summer of 1950, when Belgian Consul Albert Nave was visiting the Go Gaspar of Hamelbourg, Gaspar and other villagers decided to take the old oil paintings of the Stations of the Cross from their church and send them to the churches of Winchester as a token of friendship and proof that Hemeral had not forgotten. The paintings represent the supreme gift of the poor villagers of Hemeral, the Winchester Star reported. Nothing in their lives could possibly mean more. Before these paintings, they have gathered in joy and sorrow for nearly 50 years. They have become a real part of the lives of the people of Emerald. During the war, four of the 14 paintings were so badly damaged that they could not be sent to America. Some that were sent reportedly bore marks of Nazi bullets, which may be what Hanlon is pointing to here. A Hemerald Friendship Committee arranged a program to receive the paintings. On January 7th, 1951, again, it's snowed. And, and I think that maybe by this time you should be very glad that it's not snowing because it seems to be a recurring part of these stories. But again, it snowed. And under police escort and protection, the paintings were taken to the high school auditorium for distribution to representatives of Winchester's 10 churches. There was a program during which the paintings were face down on a table beside the lectern. Dr. Nave presented the pictures collectively to selectman Nicholas Fitzgerald, who called members of the clergy who were seated on the stage to come forward individually and receive a painting from Nave. As neither the seats nor the order of the paintings had been predetermined, chance determined which church received which painting. After all were distributed, the pastors turned to the audience to reveal the set. Eight of the ten paintings survive in Winchester, and here they are. The Baptist Church, oh, they're, they're a little green, they don't, they're really nicely colored <laughs> in, in the real. Uh, the Baptist Church has two. After the, the fire at the Baptist Church in the, in the 80s, its painting was almost destroyed. This remnant was salvaged. Then the Christian Science Church gave its painting to the Baptist Church. St. Mary's also has two, because when the Church of the Immaculate Conception closed, its painting went over to St. Mary's. The paintings arrived unframed, so each church chose its own frame, so you will see different frames around the, the different paintings. The 
There was a final exchange of gifts in 1952 when local artist Ernest Dudley Chase, by request, <coughs> made new copies of his drawings of Winchester's ten churches for a return gift, and they were sent to Ham Rule. And in 1957, when Colonel Hanlon was back in Ham Rule, he saw them hanging in Monsieur Gaspard's uh, yeah, home. Now, in 1949, Hanlon moved to Providence. Locally, he faded from the public eye. Since 1952, there have been no further exchanges between Winchester and Belgium until now. <laughs> the story of the sheets has been summarized in Winchester's two-volume town history, and over the years it has been mentioned in some books and magazine articles on World War II. I myself have known about it for a couple of decades at least, but what made me sit up and dig deeper this year is that last December, uh, last December in Bastogne, sheets were used as a symbolic gesture of friendship between the United States and Belgium. <laughs> Belgium has not forgotten <coughs> the Americans of World War II. The Martisan Memorial, located <coughs> near Bastogne, honors the memory of the 76,890 American soldiers who were wounded or killed during the Battle of the Bulge. They hold memorial observances here. Nearby is a more recent sculpture honoring specifically the 101st Airborne, sculpted by Robert Poiman. Outside the church in Hemel is a panel showing an historical route and highlighting battle moments and sites. A paragraph and photograph recall the panel page in history, and have shown that the story still has an impact. A few years before the 70th anniversary of the battle, Bill Lockhart, an American pilot passing through Hemerald, read the anecdote, went and bought some sheets, and left them at the church entrance. <laughs> when he later returned and with a colleague, both contributed sheets to help a family in need. After her appointment as U.S. Ambassador <coughs> to Belgium in August 2013, Denise Campbell Bauer toured the battlefields with Monsieur Ramac and heard many stories. Last December, she said, there are hundreds of wartime stories of courage and of individuals accomplishing great things <coughs> in the face of impossible odds, from frontline heroism from the nurses and medical staff who saved hundreds of lives, to the brave people of Belgium who risked everything, I have been deeply moved by all of these stories. There is, however, one story I would like to highlight as it touched me personally. The Sheets of Bastogne. <laughs> well, as I said at the start, it's a great story about sacrifice, courage, friendship, honor, and integrity. Ambassador Bauer recognized it. Many have been moved by it. Following Bauer's remarks, she gave a special gift of Belgian linen sheets to Mayor Benoit Lugin of Bastogne with the following embroidered inscription, in remembrance of the sacrifice of the people of the United States and of Belgium during the winter of 1944. Later, she presented sets of sheets to the Bastogne War Museum and Bastogne Barracks Museum. She also took delight in ringing the bell <laughs> and emerald. It was after this that I began getting inquiries at the archives, although I didn't know why at first. When I got one from Belgium, from Monsieur Remacle, uh, in June, well, there went my summer and fall. I was deep into research. And this little book called 500 Sheets is the result. Now, if all goes well with the shipment now en route to Bastogne, this year Ambassador Bauer will be presenting copies of 500 Sheets to Mayor Lucan, along with a photograph album of the paintings 
gifts from Winchester's Board of Selectmen as a token of continuing friendship. The book is also a tribute to all Winchester veterans, exemplified by Colonel Hanlon, and those who supported them on the, on the home front and abroad. The selectmen wanted it in a form that everyone could have and read, so we had copies for sale at town meetings, and we have copies here tonight. <laughs> now there is more to the John Hanlon story. <coughs> many stories, any more, any more stories in here? And there's more to his life story. He did realize his ambition to become a newspaper man. He was a great newspaper man. He was inducted to the Rhode Island uh, Journalism Hall of Fame. Um, I, I will just, I'm going to be closing my prepared remarks soon, but I want to squeeze in the fact that the Hanlon family story continues on. Colonel Hanlon had a sister, Janice, who got married near the beginning of the war, and she returned to Winchester later in life, and she had children. John Hanlon himself married in 1951. His wife was Joan Crump, who was an artist, and did this portrait, among others. She could not be with us tonight, but I have to say that their daughter, Martha, and cousins, Powers cousins, are here tonight. And we may be able to prevail upon them to share some memories with us. But before opening up for questions for, from you, for any of us, I have one for you. Does anyone here remember John Hamlin and the sheets for him? You do. Remember I've met a couple of people who remember. They couldn't say much, but they remember. Yeah. Bill Ryerson said his parents were involved through the Grange, and he remembers it. And I was uh, sitting at town meeting. I gave a, a presentation about Article 17, which is to form a, a an ad hoc committee to. Uh, for a 75th World War II anniversary observance committee. And after I was, and I mentioned Colonel Hanlon as an example of wonderful stories that we have from Winchester. And after I was finished, the woman who was sitting next to me said, I remember that. <laughs> uh, anybody else? You, you remember it. I remember it, yes. Mm -hmm. I remember whenever we wouldn't finish the food on our plate and we were supposed to remember the well most of the other families were remembering the starving children in some place in our house in my home was China starving children in Belgium is who we oh. had to remember <laughs> and that's not how we were encouraged to finish the food on our plate <laughs> it, it was a remarkable event uh, the only other time that I know that all the bells of the town including the town hall bell have been around, have been the ends of World War I and World War II. Um, and even then, they didn't have planes in formation flying overhead. So, um, do we have any? Well, first I should invite Martha and Peter and uh, was it Todd and, I'm sorry, Meredith. Meredith. If you have anything that you would like to add. What I would like to add is a real debt of gratitude to Ellen. She had contacted us in early this, this summer <coughs> and has just done exhaustive research. And I've said to my family, I think she knows more about my dad than I do by <laughs> now. <laughs> so it, we have to really thank you so much, Ellen. You've done a wonderful exhaustive yeah. job. Martha called me. At first I contacted Peter Powers because he, he lived right here in Winchester and uh, he had asked Martha to call me and uh, we just talked and talked and talked on the phone for a while. And later as I was thinking, I thought, it must be rather strange for someone you've never heard of to be 
doing research on your family. So I appreciate it, knowing that you appreciate the, the work that I have been doing. He was, he was, he was great. And there's no way around. He was just an admirable person. <coughs> Any questions? We're left speechless. We're no left questions. speechless. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but is, oh, some, geez, so is there okay. some yeah. martyr or memorial to him here in, in town? Well, his name is on the Veterans Memorial that's down by the, the town hall. Oh. Uh, but um, there's no memorial specific to him. I will tell you that I I did all this research and I had a lot of information about his high school athletic career, which it was too much for a book about his World War II experience. And, but I didn't want it to go to waste, and I thought, oh, he's on the Roxy uh, Hall of Fame. The, UNH Rossi Hall of Fame, the Rhode Drill Hall of Fame. Why is there the Winchester Sports Foundation Hall of Fame? I have submitted a nomination. <laughs> <laughs> so next spring, hopefully, at the sports banquet, he will be inducted to the Winchester is Sports his, Hall of Fame. Is his home on Bridge Street still standing? It is, but I no, think it's, it's been. Not. Oh, wait, what? Is he here? Oh, oh. Did he have siblings? And he had a sister, Janice. Um, one sister? One sister. And she, she married in, was it 1941? Well, she, she married before he went to England. Um, like a, lo a, lot of, a lot of people got married before they shipped overseas. Uh, my parents, May 30th, 1942. Guess where he was soon. <laughs> God. Um, any other questions? I... Oh, oh, did you bring them? Did you bring them? Yes, I did. Now, I left out... Um, just loads of his military career. After Belgium, the, the Americans pushed east, pushed the Germans back to Germany. And they ended up, uh, the winner and first ended up at Berchtesgaard. And uh, in Germany, General Maxwell Taylor liberated a set of silver cups from Hermann Goering. And he had a set of maybe ten or so, and he had them engraved for his commanding officers. And it says, 101st Airborne Division, 1944-1945, Lieutenant Colonel John J.D. Hanlon, 502nd Parachute Infantry, Infantry Regiment. And around the bottom, it says, Normandy, Holland, Bastogne, Central Europe. So, um, 